Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be on such a distinguished panel. I'm going to go ahead and get started since um, I don't know if I still have 15 minutes or not. But if not, then I, half my time is already taken up. So I'll try to move quickly. Um, so I've decided to talk about the morals of the uh, of uh, the actually the clash between U.S. rules and professional responsibility and morality. I suspect that some of my uh, talk will overlap a little bit with Mr. Rendleman, Dennis Rendleman's uh, on the ABA Ethics uh, Council, who will be speaking later. He'll be talking about the historical perspective on ten on the tension with the ABA model rules, and I suspect that some of, a, some of what I say may overlap with his. Um, but let me start off by saying uh, Watergate was, as you may know, was the greatest uh, political scandal in the American uh, in American politics in the 20th century. It involved basically a break-in of the Democratic headquarters uh, by Richard, President Richard Nixon uh, in the 70s. Um, this was really a wake-up call for the American Bar Association uh, with regard to how we um, teach our lawyers in the United States about legal ethics. Um, John Dean was the White House counsel to Richard Nixon. He was one of the first individuals that basically broke open um, the uh, the whole scandal and when he was this is a picture of him testifying before Congress in 1972 and one of the things he did was he turned over a list of uh, individuals who obstructed justice during this break-in and one curious thing about the uh, the list that he handed over was there was asterisks by two thirds of the names. And when he was asked what does the what does the asterisk mean, he said the asterisk means that these were all lawyers that were involved in this cover up and these crimes. And he said how how in God's name could so many lawyers have been involved in uh, in such a, a major crime? And the American Bar Association said the same thing. And at, th at that time, the American Bar Association decided that they demanded law schools to began teaching ethics courses in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, the, um, the legal profession still uh, does not have a uh, good reputation for honesty and ethical uh, behavior. Uh, a poll in 2009, when they were asked whether or not lawyers have uh, high ethical standards, they basically, the American public basically said, uh, or, or I should say 13% of the American public said that that lawyers had high ethics. This is a this is obviously a problem for our uh, for our profession in the United States. We were, however, ahead of Congress. Congress has about a nine percent high ethical rating, so that's actually not saying much. The highest the highest ethical rating among the professions was uh, nurses at eighty three percent. So, what are the sources of legal ethics in the United States? First, there are professional standards and rules. Again, the ABA uh, the ABA the American Bar Association has model rules of professional conduct. That's the main professional standard that we look at, and I'll focus on some of those uh, areas. And then law in general. There are court decisions that talk about discipline, malpractice, disqualification, and sanctions. They provide some of the rules uh, for our legal ethics. There are statutory laws that deal with the disqualification and discipline of federal judges. So that's another area, another source of our legal ethics. There are different administrative agencies, like the Internal Revenue Service, the Securities and Exchange Commission, they also have specific rules regarding the admission and conduct of practitioners. And then we have different procedural rules that the courts uh, follow, that the lawyers have to follow as well. So those are the main sources of legal ethics in the United States. And then when there are no rules on point, of course, we rely on our own uh, either religious traditions or philosophical traditions on what's morally right or wrong. Um, a little bit about the history of uh, legal ethics in the United States. The American Bar Association was founded in the late uh, 1800s, and shortly after it was founded, it came up with this canon of ethics or standards or rules in, 19, uh, in 1908. Those rules existed until uh, 1969. 
uh, when uh, a new code was introduced and the, the new code, the model code, uh, existed uh, from 1969 until 1983. The current, uh, the current rules are the model rules of professional conduct, which have been amended through 2009. And so that's part of what I'll be talking about today. Most of the states in the United States have adopted some form of the ABA model code. The only exception is California. They're one of the few, they're the only jurisdiction in the United States that hasn't accepted some form of the ABA model code. I think it's important to understand that um, they don't adopt entirely the ABA model code, but they, but they adopt some, um, some portion of the model code. Um, so what are the ways in which the ABA rules intersect with morality, right? Sometimes the ABA may require you to, to undertake um, uh, actions which violate your own moral code, right? So the conduct may offend your own personal morality. So being a moral person doesn't guarantee that you won't violate the code. Sometimes the ABA rules are silent on many moral issues, so you have, you're left with much discretion on how to decide. The same idea that the rules sometimes are very ambiguous. It's not very clear what you're supposed to do in a particular tradition, so you're left with much discretion. I'm going to move a little bit ahead. There's basically several areas that talk about uh, talk about the discretion that's allowed for uh, for an attorney. But I'm going to go through a few examples of what I mean when I say the ABA model code may clash with your own personal uh, responsibilities. Um, Rule 1.6 talks about the confidentiality of information. Rule 1.6 of the ABA model code is very similar to Rule 2.3 of the Code of Conduct for Lawyers in the European Union, right? They both talk about confidentiality of information. Um, and in many cases, I suspect that um, the outcomes under the Code of Conduct for Lawyers in the European Union will be similar to the outcome uh, of Rule 1.6 in the ABA Model Code. So the example I have is you represent a client, Client C, in the murder of a young woman. Uh, during your representation, the client tells you that he killed two other young girls, and he tells you where the bodies are buried uh, or where they're located. You go to the hiding place, you discover that the client has been telling the truth. No one knows that these other uh, girls are dead and the parents and the police are searching for them as runaways, right? What do you do under the rules? Well, under, I suspect again that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the outcome under the Rule 1.6 and 2.3 of the Code of Conduct for Lawyers in the European Union would ver be very similar. There is no exception to reveal the client's confidences. So you cannot go to the police or the parents and say, I know where these other, uh, these other uh, uh, victims are you must uh, you must retain the confidences of the client right and the policy reasons under the ABA model rules are very similar to the policy reasons under the code of conduct uh, for European Union lawyers and that is we want clients to come to us to tell us the truth because it's the best way that we can assist uh, assist them um, Example number two, the same, same rule. The client C is injured on the job and you win a settlement. You file a lawsuit on behalf of the client and you win a settlement. But unknowingly, you rely on a disability rating from uh, a doctor that has been falsified by the client. The client, in other words, gives you uh, information that is false from a doctor that does not exist. Um, and after settlement, you come to know of the fraud. And the question again is, what can you do? Can you reveal that information? And the answer again to this is, it's not quite clear. Under the rule, under Rule 1.6, there are some exceptions where you can reveal information. Uh, there's no similar exception, as far as I know, in uh, the Code of Conduct for Lawyers of the EU. But in the uh, United States rules, there are uh, exceptions exceptions where you can reveal information where the injury is uh is likely to result in substantial, or I'm sorry, where the where the lie is uh, 
uh, is likely to cause substantial injury to the financial interest or property of another. So the question here is whether or not this injury that has been caused by this fraud will cause substantial injury. And if it causes substantial injury, then you can reveal the information. But again, it's somewhat discretion. Uh, there's a lot of discretion allowed as to whether or not it causes substantial, uh, substantial injury. So again, it's not entirely clear what you can do on this particular issue. Issue. You've got a lot of discretion. Uh, example number three is where the client requests your assistance um, in the um, uh, in a criminal action, right? So the client comes in and tells you, uh, "I intentionally burned down my office, and I need you to file for uh, insurance, uh, the insurance money for the uh, uh, for the for for this this fire." Um, you decline, uh, you decline the representation, but the client goes to another attorney. Um, but see, but the client then, the other attorney doesn't tell them that he's committed arson. He simply says, "My office burned down, uh, and I want you to file for insurance." And again, the answer is, "What can you do? Can you tell the insurance company? Can you tell the authorities?" And I suspect again that the answer here would be the same as you would find under the Code of Conduct for Lawyers in the EU. In this particular case, there's no exception. You cannot reveal the confidences of the client. Again, this is sort of this conflict between your own personal morals um, and the rules, right? Because your morals may say the right thing to do is to prevent uh, the client from, uh, from committing this crime. I think I'm going to go ahead and skip example four because I'm, I've got about four more minutes. And I really think that uh, this last section is very, uh, uh, is, uh, is rather important because one of the things that happens in the United States is that many lawyers will um, prepare their witnesses before they testify before the courts. And there's always a discussion in the United States about whether preparing a witness is, is morally correct or not. That is, in preparing the witnesses, or some say coaching the witness, are you in fact uh, trying to convince the, um, the, uh, uh, the client to perjure themselves or to tell a lie. And the question is, should we even be participating in the coaching of witnesses? And the rules would say, yes, there's a very valuable reason why you need to prepare or coach witnesses. Number one, rule 1.1 says that you must give competent and diligent representation. And in order to give competent and diligent representation, you must prepare the witness. The witness, the witness or the client does not know the law. You know the law. The reason why you You've been hired is because the client expects you to prepare him. The client expects you to tell him about the law. And so part of that means you have to competently and diligent rep diligently represent them. You have to communicate with the client uh, the reasons behind the law and how the law might help or hurt the client. I'm going to uh, continue going on. But the difficulty comes from getting the facts from the client versus putting the facts into the client, right? When you're coaching the witness, what you want to do is get the facts from the client. You don't want to put the facts into the client. And this is where uh, the difficulty lies, this, this delicate line between telling the client what they should say versus getting the information from the client. Um, these are actually some, some uh, uh, some cartoons that kind of talk about this uh, this particular issue. Here you have the lawyer telling the client, okay, let's review what you didn't know and when you didn't know it, right? I mean, is this, is this preparation or is this telling the client to participate in a lie to the court, right? Here's another example where the client is saying, I love my testimony. You really captured my voice, right? And so this is sometimes what lawyers are, are uh, accused of doing is preparing the testimony saying, here's what I want you to read, right, as opposed to getting the information from the client and using the client's own words. So there is, again, this very uh, delicate, uh, delicate balance. But again, there are legitimate reasons 
for uh, preparing the witness, and those are to discuss the client's perceptions, his or her recollection, and possible testimony, to review documents. Again, you owe this to the client. It's part of your moral responsibility as a legal representative to prepare uh, your client, to explain how the law applies to a particular examination, to prepare the client for probable lines of uh, cross-examination, and really to rehearse their testimony, not to rehearse in the sense of here's how you lie, but to rehearse the testimony in the sense of you want to make sure that the client makes the best presentation possible. So these are all legitimate reasons for uh, preparing the witness. Nevertheless, however you prepare the witness, there's always the possibility that the, the client's story will be altered. So in preparing the witness, you need to be very, very careful in preparing the witness. And most importantly, you need to remind the witness that the witness will be under oath and that the client has the responsibility to tell the truth to the court. This is a problem that many lawyers have in preparing witnesses is they fail to communicate to the client that they are under oath and that they have a responsibility to tell the truth. If you don't tell the client this, then there is a likelihood that the client may get the message that you're trying to tell him to create false stories. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there because I see I'm at 15 minutes and 28 seconds and I don't want to take up anybody else's time. But the basic point here is that the lawyer is the only one in these cases who's able to monitor uh, his own, his or her own behavior. So ultimately, the more moral responsibility is up to the lawyer themselves. And I'll let the next individual. Thank you for your attention.